I always have this up on my computer at all times because there might be a there might be a time when I'm just doing some random thing and I need to use piano tech. So um, can you all hear this? Yeah, so I can just move these things at any any moment, right? And it's very freeing because I don't have to like sit there and really think too hard about any one microtone. I can just, whatever pitch comes to mind at that time, I will start writing it, okay? That's like when I'm being very free about it, okay? So there are times when I'm very free about it, like I'm doing right now. There are other times where I actually sit there and, and come up with systems. So for example, in a piece that I wrote a few pieces back, I would come up with basically almost like a matrix. So if you have like a, a C scale, right? With the first five notes, C, D, E, F, G. And I want, let's say the third note to be down a quarter tone. I wouldn't just stay there. I would say, okay, what is that going to sound like in every key? So C, C sharp, D, D. I would do it in all keys. I would have, I would have it written out next to me on the, on my desk. So it's easy access. I don't have to think too hard. Like, oh, what's that? quarter tone third starting on f sharp like i, I like i can't i'm not going to recall that instantly so writing these things out is very very helpful for me and i also think too i don't i don't limit myself to just having the quarter tones be in the scale sometimes they're the root of the scale too so a lot of the times we think of quarter tones as being like decorations of a of a scale but what if the quarter tones started the scale so for example, if I were to share my screen here and say, I'm going, I, I want to do, so that's C major, right? What if I wanted to start a little higher? So now the, the C half sharp becomes the root of the scale rather than C natural or A natural or something like that. And I feel like that is not really talked as much about. Like, how do you make making these quarter tones the root of the scale sometimes uh, gives uh, the listener a feeling of, okay, actually, this is what the music is. Not so much, okay, it's a decoration, right? Because the only note that wasn't a decoration, that wasn't a quarter tone happened to be the third in this case. Everything was a quarter tone except the third. And the third actually sounds the weirdest here. So there are ways to, to do it beyond like some of these like, uh, like ways that we might have seen uh, microtonal music be made. Does anyone have any uh, questions about that, specifically what I just played? I do. Do you work with any particular systems, any divisions of the octave? Like, do you do any like 17 tet or... 33 tet or anything like that or I've, work? yeah i've seen those i've seen those things of course but i work primarily either in just intonation or with 24 tet or some combination of those two only because i main i mainly work with live musicians and even 24 tet 24 tet is basically the the farthest most of them can handle and there is no way i can bring 17 tet or 33 tet or 36 tet or 19 tet or any of the other common ones out there unless i was using a computer a synthesizer, you know, along with it. But even then, it, it's very difficult, I find, with um, classical... I'm talking about classical musicians. It might be different with people that have a new music background. In other words, people that play contemporary classical music for a living. They might be able to do those kind of systems. Like the Jack Quartet can definitely do those systems. But your average classical musician that graduated from a conservatory won't be able to play uh, those systems without significant training. Yeah. So zone is just basically like the safe safe zone if you wanted to do any sort of microtonal music. I wouldn't consider anything microtonal safe. <laughs> <laughs> I just came back from an orchestra session uh, concert last week. I just came off the plane yesterday and um, it was very difficult for them to wrap their heads around the microtones. And it wasn't until I did something like this, just to give you some real world advice, I had this scale in the beginning of the piece. So this is a D, E, F half sharp, G, A, G, F half sharp, E, D. 
and they just couldn't wrap their mind around this at all, you know? Oh, man. So what we had to do was we did this. So we had the whole orchestra play D. Then we had the whole orchestra play E. Then we had the whole orchestra play F sharp. And then the conductor said, all right, go down half, like a quarter step. Okay. And then I, then he said, go up to G and then go down to F half sharp. And that, that, then it started to kind of make sense, this kind of way of doing it, like compare it to the major scale. And then there's a part of the piece that's an F minor, but the G is down a quarter tone. So we did the same exact exercise and we did it also starting on A. So we did it three times on D, on F and on A. And mm. that took them all getting used to. Even after we did it slowly, it was still difficult. So it's still a work in progress. And I'm, by the way, I'm talking about classical musicians. These are people that play Brahms, Schumann, Beethoven. This is, this is, these are the people I'm talking about. They're, they don't play new music um, all the time. As far as introducing microtonality to an audience, my suggestion that's worked for me, it uh, doesn't mean it works for everyone. My suggestion is not to mention it at all. <laughs> because then they'll start to try to listen for it and then they'll forget that the piece exists <laughs> if in my opinion if you're if you're using microtones right you shouldn't you shouldn't even hear them <laughs> yeah because if you hear them that means like you're not paying attention to the piece you're just trying to catch where all the microtones are and then they lose the motion of the piece. They lose the form. They lose everything else about the piece that makes it interesting. The, it's it's imagine like you're listening to a piece of twelve tet music, um, and you're trying to listen for all the intonation mistakes. That some people, you know, that's not listening to music. That's just trying to listen for mistakes. So I mean, this took me a long time to figure out. By the way. Um, I used to always mention it in concerts, oh, you know, I'm using the Arabic Maqam, you know, I'm using a, you know, it's a D major scale, but the third is down a chord. You know, I would start saying these kind of things and it would just fly by most of the audience, even a technical audience. Um, and they would just pay attention to that rather than all the notes, rhythms, form, timbres, everything else that I think is interest more interesting about the piece. So if, uh, I hope that answers that question about approaching it because I, I, I think it's the opposite. If we try to normalize these notes, um, the more an audience would accept them and, and the more an audience would barely tell that they're there. You know, you don't want, you don't tell an audience, like if you're using, um, uh, you don't tell an audience if you're using jazz harmony, oh, I'm using seventh, you know, I'm using uh, 13 chords, 13 sharp four chords in this, like you wouldn't say that. You would just say, oh, you know, these are there's this is influenced by Charlie Parker or something. You wouldn't say, oh, this is uh this is this chord progression from from this specific piece, right? So um yeah, that I found success with that. Um so for example, the piece I had last week that had all the microtones, it was the fanfare, which I posted recently on the channel. Um I uh almost everyone that came up to me, and and I'm talking these are older donors, right? They're like in their 80s. None of them mentioned the microtones to me. Not a single one. They all were talking about, oh, you know, it was so uplifting, this and that. Oh, I felt like I was on a trip up the PCH. This is the highway in California on the coast. That's the kind of stuff they were telling me. They weren't talking about the microtones at all because I didn't prime them to listen for them, listen to them. They all heard something was kind of off, but they didn't quite know what it was and it didn't really bother them either, you know? So um, I thought that was quite interesting. And I learned a lot actually last week through that process of uh, just framing the piece in a different way. Yeah, I have a kind of specific question about yeah. uh, microtones. So um, when I use microtones, I only really use the just seventh uh, and fifth partials. Mm -hmm. And I think it kind of gets a little bit just like, like I said, I it gets kind of boring. Or not boring to me, but uh, like in my jury, someone was like, 
you should use more and i'm afraid of using the more like extended hedgy uh like the more extended uh like tuning mm -hmm. for it uh and i was just wondering if you had any insight into how to make it like more interesting maybe than just the seventh and fifth partial or maybe the 11th mm -hmm. yeah yeah so just in case people here don't know what is talking about so he's talking about the harmonic series so if we start on c this is the first partial the second partial which is an octave the third partial which is the fifth fourth partial which is the c again the root the fifth partial is when it starts to get a little out of tune so this is one uh this is going to be like one twelfth of a tone and then we have our sixth and then we have our sixth of a tone down okay so you're saying you use basically these intervals and the jury says uh it's boring is that what well it's saying? just like you should find out a way to do more with it than just because every time basically i have a seventh i just flat it mm -hmm. or a third and then at that point i could just write in the score i'll play all sevenths and thirds right and, uh, well it's the same uh i won't spend too much time on this just in the interest of time but think of it don't think of it so much as fifth fifth and seventh partials Think of it as these are two, first of all, imagine if we we're talking about functional harmony. If you were just in the key of, right? If you were just doing, I'm, I'm being very uh, general, but if you were just in C major, the whole piece, right? This is not something that composers normally do, right? They modulate to other key areas. You know, if you want to use the fifth and seventh partial, use the fifth and seventh partial but maybe literally using, if you're in the key of C, E and B flat all the time, maybe that's a little much in a, you know, 10 minute plus piece. But yeah. if you wanted to go down, like what if you modulate, like what if you modulated, you know? What if you went from C major, what do, what do a lot of com uh, composers do? They go to the, the fifth or they go to the fourth or they go to the third, right? Maybe, what if you modulated to F major? So that would mean that you would have the A down, the third is down, and then you have the E flat down. So what if you, I mean, what if you simply did that? I mean, what, what, what new worlds can you open up? You know, I didn't, I didn't use any extra partials, you know, I mean, that's a very simple answer, right? But sometimes the simplest answers are the correct ones and you can use functional harmonic uh rules to modulate also yeah. right so you could you can borrow the rules from functional harmony to get to f or g or g sharp or whatever key uh you mm -hmm. want um and so on so anyway i can talk about this this top this specific topic for probably the rest of the day but uh we got to get to other uh questions i hope that was helpful this idea of what slows down a uh, composer and how I think that's one to one related to this idea of score study. So for example, I had a student yesterday, we had a lesson and he was telling me, you know, I'm having a lot of, this is a common problem, right? I'm having a lot of trouble composing. I'm not, my head is not in it right now. It's a very slow process for me, right? This is like a common thing, right? Um, then I would ask the student, you know, how much score study have you done recently? And the answer is usually very little is zero. <laughs> okay. When you're learning a language, has anybody learned a, a language like that, like a non, you know, non-native language? Has anybody done that? Okay. One. Faya, what did you learn? Eng is it English? I'm assuming. Yeah. English. English. Yeah. When you're learning English, let me ask you, when you're learning English, when you start learning English, how many things are there? Reading, writing, speaking, listening, right? Which of those four did you do the most in the first six months of learning English? Reading, writing, listening, or speaking? I think it uh, was uh, writing and reading. You were writing and reading? Yeah. Which one were I... you doing more of between the writing and the reading? Reading. Okay. So is that a reading an input or an output? So. If you're writing, right? In other words, if you're composing music all the time, 
and you don't feel like you're getting better, the problem most likely has to do with you don't have enough inputs. In other words, you're not listening to enough music. Yeah. This is something I also learned myself because I learned Italian a couple of years ago. I realized I had to listen a lot more than I spoke. And it took me almost a year of listening, listening, listen, before I can even really say anything that made sense as an Italian speaker. And I think that the same thing applies to writing. I think that my sense from the students that I've encountered in my own studies is that the score study element is not as important for whatever reason uh, mm -hmm. than the writing process. So that's that's my number one thing uh, when it comes to getting, because I feel like when you get stuck, forget the, get the paper out of the way, get the Sibelius or whatever notation, go and study a score or a, a bunch of scores and you'll be shocked how might how something might inspire you for something else it happens to me uh a lot and every time i write a brand new piece of music myself i am always looking at scores i i never start a new piece without looking at a bunch of scores like ever um so that's my advice on that. I just want to say that I'm glad you mentioned that because I kind of do wish that like in like the university environment they would put a little more emphasis on it and since I just uh, I completed my master's thesis and uh, for that composers have to just analyze like any like uh, contemporary work basically and I analyzed new addresses by uh, Chris Cerrone and I've always liked Cerrone's music but I found myself like amazed at how much I learned about like his compositional uh, methods and practice just by like delving into his score. Absolutely. And new addresses, uh, that's the chamber chamber piece, right? One of the yeah. chamber. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So that's, I remember when I was at S USC, uh, I do it a lot. I did it a lot. Every weekend I would check out a big pile of scores like this high and I would just, I was maniacal about it. I would listen to everything. And the way that I did it um, is I would check out, like, you know, when you go to the music library, um, you go to the library and like all the names of the same composer are next to each other. So I would, that's what I would do. I would just take them all the <laughs> same person and that would be my weekend. And that was an easy way. I, I thought that was an easy way to do it. Cause I didn't have to like pick and choose. I just took everything by that one person and then, all right, that was the weekend. All right. Next weekend, take another. And, uh, I didn't skimp on, uh, older music. You know, I did the Shostak. I, I remember one weekend taking home all the Shostakovich symphonies, you know. Uh, so it's not just about the new music. It's also the older uh, music, too. I don't think um, we should forget those either. In addition to uh, any score study, do you read any uh, papers, any articles, any, like, uh, biographies uh, or other people's analysis of particular pieces? Like, if you were to... I remember going on a Ludoslavsky kick and reading the Stucky book and Oh, wow. Yeah. So getting into like those, uh, those other resources in addition to your score study. Wow. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but I studied with Stephen Stuckey, uh, oh, yeah. maybe 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. When I was in high school, actually, it was, uh, he was amazing. Like, yeah, I credit him with a lot. Uh, he's very, very, yeah. He, he passed away about eight years ago, brain cancer, uh, yeah, but he yeah, he's super influential, at least for me, as a teacher especially. Has anybody ever, to search a topic, looked up a dissertation based on that topic? Yeah, for sure. Okay, I do this all the time. So, for example, I had a student, it was a particular kind of Serbian brass playing that I had no idea about, but he wanted to, he really wanted to dive deep into it. And all, and he had the same problem that probably most of us have he was just listening to recordings and not learning much from much from it beyond just repeated listenings and, and transcribing, but he wanted to get deeper. So I just told him, look up that Serbian exact, the name of that exact thing and put thesis or dissertation after the word, uh, and see what you find. And lo and behold, there were all these dissertations about that exact, uh, type of music. And it had all these transcriptions of different kind of folk, uh, songs and such and, uh, and and the best part a bibliography that pointed him to other resources um this is extremely helpful so um in addition to your score study uh you can see if anybody else did the legwork for you um so i would i would recommend that as well um that being said be careful you don't want to, <laughs> there is an equilibrium to this where you could you're, you're stuck in research land 
you know, and you forget to write. There, there is an equilibrium, you know, to this world I've, I've found. The thing about networking, somebody asked about networking. I'll just share with you a story about this and then we'll move on because this is another one of those questions that people think there is a straight head answer for. One of my friends, I'm not going to say who it is, but because I interviewed him on the show, he just moved to New York recently to study for his doctorate and he knew no one okay like this literally zero he was from like the midwest he had asked me like you know i uh, and also the place he was going for school doesn't didn't have musicians it wasn't a conservatory so he really had zero connection as far as musicians so he asked me like you know i'm really worried about coming here in new york to the school they don't have musicians i'm afraid my music is not going to get played you know, what do I do? So that's what he asked me. So I just told him, what you do is you go to every freaking concert you possibly can. And he told me, that's it. I said, that's literally it. You go to every single concert you can. People are going to start, especially like the smaller concerts. I'm not talking about New York Philharmonic and their Met Opera. I'm not talking about, you know, BS concerts like that, where you're not going to meet anyone. I'm talking about small, you know, 20 person, 30 person maximum seat concerts where really good ensembles are playing. They want butts in the seats. So why, why couldn't, why, and the tickets are cheap. They're either free or they're like 10 bucks. Put your butt in that seat and see what happens. And he did. And lo and behold, now he knows some, he has so many performance. I mean, not even, I'm like, I tell him all the time I see him, I'm so proud of him because he, he didn't like wimp out, <laughs> you know, he went and did it. He, he was very shy about it in the beginning, but then once he realized he was meeting people doing this, it became infectious for him. He started doing it more and more, you know, and, and now it's a regular thing. Of course, he's going to go to two or three concerts a week. Like why, you know, why, why not? I mean, he probably knows more music, you know, maybe he knows more musicians than I do at this point, you know, and he puts on concerts now too. He even has his own ensemble and I've seen him in action. It's very impressive. And this has just happened in like under two years. So of course, you know, this is New York city, right? I mean, he's in New York city. That's one thing, but, but you can also be in New York city and just be like locked in your room, just focusing on composing and score study and doing your schooling. I, I know a lot of composers that did that too. And they didn't really get far at all because they didn't want to accept the fact that they had to put in the work themselves. They're not going to come to you. You have to go to them. That's a favorite recent anecdote where something I actually suggested worked out and it worked out really quickly too for him. So I was uh, wondering what you think about like uh, writing just to write. I mean, most of the time when I write, I'm just writing something like uh, that a student performer or ensemble has asked me to write for them. That's, I'd say right now that takes up like probably like 80 90 percent mm -hmm. of my uh, uh composing but what do you like uh i i totally get what you're saying that like uh for commissions it's more about the name than the money and i i, I totally get that I agree but what do you think of like writing just something you want to write when you're not even sure if it will get performed so the question is the question is you write something just to write it without having a player in mind even even that mm -hmm. far yeah i i this is again you know, we were on this call because we're hearing my opinion and also your opinions, right? This is, that's why we're here. I, it's my personal opinion that if, if you're not writing for someone, I think that you're fighting a very uphill battle. Unless you're writing like electroacoustic music or electronic music or something like this. But if it's like something that's meant to be played by a saxophonist, by a violinist, by someone with, you know, technical ability, right? A string quartet, whatever it is, I think it's like, I think you're fighting an uphill battle with that because what's going to happen is, you know, you write, let's say you write a solo violin. Let's, let's keep it easy. Let's not say orchestra or something. Let's say solo violin, or solo trumpet or something. Let's, let's be realistic, right? Let's say you write this solo violin piece, right? Let's just go through the entire life cycle. Just humor me. So you write the solo violin piece. You want to write it because maybe you, you feel like it or you don't have a solo violin piece. Okay. You write the thing. It takes you. Let's say it takes you two months. Let's just say it takes you two months. You wrote this 10 minute piece. I'm just putting in numbers here. You can put in any number you want. Okay. You have the piece. Great. You finished the piece. You're happy with it. You're really not really sure if it works because you haven't, you haven't collaborated with someone on it. Right. Um, it's just a finished piece. Okay. Then you go to try to find somebody to play. So now you've spent these two months writing it. Now you're trying to find somebody to play it. So now you're spending more time after that trying to find somebody to play it, right? Then let's say you try to find someone to play it, right? Now the piece is like completely done. 
So if the piece is completely done, who has the agency in that piece? Is it you or the musician? That's a, that's a question for you, for anyone. Who has the agency in this, in this relationship? The composer, you that wrote the piece, or the musician, the, the person you're presenting the piece? The musician. The musician has the agency? Did the musician have any part to do with that piece? Yeah. The composer has the agency in this relationship. So think about, think, imagine you're the violinist you're approaching. What relationship do I have to this piece? I had no agency in making it. I have no stake in the game. So why, like, imagine you're the violinist. Like, why would I want to play this piece? Right? Like, put yourself in the shoe of the performer. Now flip it on the other side. You approach them, right? You're at a concert or something, or you, or, or you meet this person. You say, hey, you are such a terrific player. I would love to write a piece for you, you know? completely free, you know, don't worry about it. Whenever you'd like to do it too, like, do you have a concert coming up or a recording session, whatever. I would love to write you a piece because X, Y, Z, I love how you play the ligety or whatever it was. Okay. If you think I, if you think this is just by the way, BS advice, right? Cause sometimes when I say this, people are like, what? I did the exact same thing with the string quartet a few years ago, uh, right before COVID. Um, I did the exact same thing. They played, I was at a concert. They played the Ligeti String Quartet number one. I literally went, I didn't know them. I went up to them after, during intermission. I said, you know, I'm really sorry to bother you guys because they were like getting, uh, they were, they only played the first half. They didn't play the second half. I said, I talked to one, the first chair. I said, I'm really sorry to bother you. You know, I'm a composer. I just want to say your Ligeti String Quartet was amazing. Um, and uh, if there was ever a time I could write you something, I would be honored, you know, because I really enjoy it. And that was it. That's all I said. So I, what I just told you, that was literally what I did. And this was completely, this was a bonus. This is completely by accident, right? That, and this is not going to happen, okay? 99 times out of 100. But it happened to me this, at this day. I'll never forget. I get home that night and, uh, you know, I'm thinking, I'm still thinking about them and, the, and their performance and all that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I emailed them actually to confirm by, to say, by the way, again, this is my email. Thank you so much. And, uh, et cetera, uh, for hearing me out. And the next day I, I, I'm not lying. This is actually what happened. They wrote back to me and said, actually the Caramore festival has, uh, wants to commission a new composer to write for us for next summer. And they have $9,000. Is, is that all right with you? This was like four or five years. I say, yeah, sure. <laughs> so again, this is a kind of an extreme version of what I just told you, right? But it happens and it happens all the time. And it, it was a very natural process too. And now the, the the quartet has agency now in this relationship, not just the couple. I didn't mean to put this thumbs up, but uh, okay. And now I froze. Let me stop the camera. Okay, now it's better. Okay. okay. Good, good question, by the way, because I, I really wanted to mention that. I teach this class at, um, I just finished the semester with New Jersey City University. I teach under, I teach a variety of classes there. Um, one of them is, is a basic undergraduate composition class. So it was seven, it was kind of similar to like us here, seven composers. And these composers started from zero, by the way, like absolute, like absolute zero. Like they've never opened up a notation software. Um, they barely knew how to even write music down on paper. Um, these were like very, very beginning students. Um, uh, their degree was in music education, actually. So I was able to, um, during the course of the semester, come up with a set of materials that would help them generate ideas. Okay. So there was, uh, I'll give you an example. So we would, uh, we would, split the semester up um, into chunks relating to relating to what I call the uh, the five pillars of composition okay or, or five pillars of music even rhythm melody harmony timbre form right those are the five if there's another one please let me know but I think those are that's it right melody rhythm Harmony, timbre, form. Okay. So melody, in other words, when I say melody, I mean an independent line. I don't mean like literally a tune. It could be anything that's an independent line. 
uh, when I say harmony, I which I don't really let, mean harmony in the sense of a chord. When I mean harmony, I'm talking about multiple sounds at the same time. That's what I mean by harmony. When I'm talking about timbre, literally, what what are what are the frequencies that we're hearing in terms of like the harmonic spectrum of each sound? So my voice is a different timbre than Gordon's voice. Is a different timbre than Gordon's voice, right? That's what we mean uh, when we talk about form. Uh, how do all those things change over time? Which at the end of the day is probably the most important out of the five, because that's how we listen to music, right? So those are the five. I split the whole semester. It was 10 week, 10, 12 weeks or so. I basically spent two weeks on each of those five. Okay. The, and just to give you, I'm going to give you kind of, I'm going to share my screen here. So I did very specific because they were such beginners. I really had to do very be systematic with what we what we did in that class. So here is an example of one of the first things I did. So here is um see this is kind of early on January we did a rhythm seminar. So I had a uh, a rhythm folder that had access to scores and materials for this module. I also showed them ways to notate for the various percussion instruments that's what these links are. Then I just gave them five very, I gave them five uh, links to different kinds of percussion music just to just to get their ears wet in percussion music, okay? And then I asked them to do a mini project, okay? So I call this the rhythm mini project. So here's the assignment part of it. Write five 20 to 30 second compositions with the rhythm as the focus. So I asked them to do this in five ways so that they can get a different sense. They can have a different starting point for each one. So the first one, one non-pitched instrument. Okay. Then I asked them to do two non-pitched instruments. Then I said one pitched instrument. Then I said use two pitched instruments. Then I said use one non-pitched instrument and one pitched instrument. And then I asked them to make, then I asked them how to deliver the, you know, this is just for the class, how to deliver the music to me. But basically the idea is, okay, these are all have to do with rhythm, but because we started from a different place, right? You're gonna end up generating different ideas. If I asked you to come up with five excerpts that all had a bass drum, that would be that would be a very boring assignment and you would probably come up with similar things for every one of those things. But if I ask you to start from a different place in terms of instrumentation, you're probably gonna generate music that's different for each of those five. And maybe one of those five ends up being a halfway decent idea that you can go off of for a piece. So if we keep going down, I we basically did this for every uh, everything. So we did this for melody, um, and we did it for harmony. So this exact process, um, we did it for every single um, uh, section of the class. So. I, I like doing these kind of exercises. I've never done them before, actually. That was my first time, but I, I was surprised how effective uh, this ended up being. Because again, I started composing when I was very young. I was like eight years old when I started. So I kind of, by the time I got to college personally, I didn't really have to do these exercises. I was kind of, it was already ingrained in me. But for someone that's just starting, you know, you have to kind of think, you have to, like what I was saying with, you have to be in their shoe, right? Like they literally do not know how to come up with an idea. What what would be the process, right? He says, this reminds me of the Jorge Varilla, uh, what is this book? Composing with Constraints. I don't know this book. Yeah, it's, it's just it's the same sort of idea. It just enumerates several uh, exercises the same sort of way. It's uh, published by Oxford University Press. Okay, so Can you, do you mind putting that in the Google Doc too, right, under your name? That would be... Amazing. How to, how to actually start writing a piece of music. I mean, this is different for everybody. Um, but I always, always, always encourage everyone to, to not be lazy and get, and, and, and write in front of, and write with staff paper first and get used to what your hand looks like writing. Get used to what it looks like when you write notes down, because just that act, you'd be surprised it, it, helps you have some kind of pride over what you're doing and just, and it helps build your confidence a little bit. And sometimes just that is enough to get you going. But if you're just kind of looking on the computer 
and uh, forget like being distracted by Facebook or whatever, like forget even that exists, right? But just like looking on the computer at pitches and 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 the software that everybody else is looking at, like that really psychologically makes you feel that, you know, you have to write music that's kind of like that. And I just don't, I don't ascribe to that. I think that, um, I think that's psychologically tough when you're just working straight into the software. So that would be my number one piece of advice there. Um, don't go straight into the software in the beginning, but use the software when you're writing. Don't, don't wait till the end either. Use it while you're writing. I think is extremely helpful uh process okay wait so just to clarify you write by hand while you're yes your notation software open yes i do same time okay yeah yeah i do <laughs> <laughs> i have logic open too i have logic uh so you can't really see it here but i'm in front of my second monitor right here i usually have um logic or with piano tech open right here and my piano you can't see it but my piano is right here so I'm looking at this monitor and I'm playing on the keyboard. Then I'm, sometimes I record right into this logic with piano tech. And then on this side here, you can see a desk right here. See this desk? This desk here has manuscript paper and pens and pencils. Okay. That's my writing station. And I, what I have is overkill. Okay. I, I just, it's overkill. I, I mean, this is 10 years in plus of writing. I, I figured out what I like. Everyone's different. Uh, right here is my main monitor. That's where my my Sibelius or Dorico. Uh, I kind of interchange between the two, but those that's where that lives. Um, so I can just take my manuscript paper right here that lives here. I put it right here. I have a table here as well. I play. Then I would take that and I move it over here and I put it into Sibelius or Dorico. So I have like a system, but everybody's different. You know, I, I like to center my system around the manuscript paper. That's, that's kind of like my God, you know, whatever's on that manuscript paper, I want to adhere to that and not be so influenced about what I see on the, on the screen. Okay. The question about, uh, like core theory concepts that are preliminary to composition, what those are, what do you think the most foundational theory concepts for, um, before a composer starts? Basically anything starting from the 15th century onwards to the 19th century. I don't think like early 20th century stuff is that applicable yet to start. I think you have plenty <laughs> to go through. And, I, I, and I, I highly suggest do not ignore the medieval stuff. That stuff is always ignored. People always start with Bach. That's usually what happens. You start with four part harmony. I highly recommend like if you have the time, uh, please do not forget the medieval uh, music because that over, always gets overlooked, in my opinion. Yeah, modal counterpoint, exactly. Modal counterpart, isorhythms, motets, things like that.